we've been talking about rotation. I mean, uh, we first we started talking about the kinematics of rotational motion, right? Then we talked about what can cause rotation. We said that it was torque. Then we went and said, if an object is not moving, what do we know about the torques acting on the system? We said, we know that this, the sum of the torques should be equal to zero. And in addition to that, the sum of the forces should be equal to zero. But now it's the time, of course, to figure out what is the connection between the torque that you apply to an object and how exactly, precisely, this object is going to rotate. Right? So the equation that we have is, you can start from Newton's second law and uh, apply it to every piece of the object that was done, you know, 100 years after Newton came out with, uh, with his laws. And the result is this, that the torque, this quantity that we've been talking about, the net torque, which remember is the sum of all of the forces, act, all of the torques acting on the system, that net torque is very special because that's the one that's the quantity that produces or that it makes the object rotate and it makes the object rotate in a particular way. It gives the object an angular acceleration and the eye that it's in front, we talked about it, that's the moment of inertia. So the right th way to think about this equation is that acceleration, angular acceleration, is a result of having a net torque acting on the system. Angular acceleration is the result of having a net torque acting on the system. Just like we thought about this equation as a net force causing an object to accelerate. If you remember uh, the discussion about, uh, that we had about if there is no force, then what happens, right? And uh, the connection between force and motion, it will be easy for you to realize that when there is no torque, there can be rotational motion, right? An object can be spinning even though there is no torque acting on it. It will spin in a particular way, right? Which way is that? Acceleration, angular acceleration is zero, which means that the object would spin with constant angular velocity. It would just keep spinning forever if there is no torque applied to that object. So if you see videos of the astronauts in the International Space Station and they grab a cup of coffee or something, whatever object, and they spin it, right? You see this object going and going and going and going, floating in space, just spinning. Because there is no torque acting on the object. So whatever angular velocity the astronaut gave it at the beginning is going gonna, gonna to keep it for a very long time. The only thing that might be doing torque, but it's a very small amount, will be air drag, right? So that would eventually bring that cup to uh, rest, okay? But it's going to last a long time. And if you did this in vacuum outside of the Inter International Space Station, then it would uh, continue to spin forever. Of course, there's no such, such thing as forever, but very, very, very long time, millions of years, billions of years. <clears throat> the Earth has been spinning for 4.5 billion years now, it's still going, and there's no torque, or the amount of torque is very small. All right, so that's the equation that we want to use when we have a net torque, and therefore the object is going to spin. And it's not just going to spin, it's going to accelerate. So here is a typical problem so um, maybe I should make it a little bigger. So we have a pulley here, supported, of course, by something. And there is a rope wrapped around the pulley. And at this end of the rope, we attach an object, which has a mass, I'm going to call it MB for mass of the block. The pulley so far. We have assumed that pulleys in, in physics had no mass, right? Now it's the time to deal with pulleys that do have a mass, because now we know how to do, deal with that. The mass of the pulley is MP. 
So what's going to happen when I let go of this mass? It's going to fall, correct? And as it's falling, what happens to the pulley, to the disc? Let's assume that the pulley is a disc. Disc with radius r. The disc is going to spin also, right? As the block drops, the disc is going to spin. Now we're going to assume that the rope that there is enough friction between the, the rope and the disc such that the rope doesn't slip. So if I were to look at a magnified view of what's going on here, right? This will be the disc and the rope is here. The disc is going to be spinning, right? And if you follow the motion of one point in the disk, that disk would have a velocity, right? Which you can call tangential velocity of that point in the disk. And this is a point that you can mark on the rope. And the rope is moving down because the block is pulling on the rope. So the rope is moving down, it has some velocity, right? If the rope doesn't slip, what do we know about those velocities? They should be the same. If one was bigger, if the rope had a bigger velocity, it would be rubbing this way. If the rope had less velocity than the disc, the disc will be moving this way, rubbing against the rope, the string. So for sure, if the condition is that there's no slipping of the rope, then we know that these two velocities should be the same. And if those velocities are the same, what happens to the accelerations? What do we know about the accelerations? They must be the same, right? So that means the acceleration of the rope is going to have to be equal to the tangential acceleration of the disk. Tangential acceleration of an object, in this case, this x that I did with a marker, right? That x has some tangential acceleration in circular motion tangential acceleration and angular acceleration, I connect it through that equation. And I hope you remember where this equation is coming from. It's directly from the definition of angle in radians. Should I remind you of that? Theta in radians is defined as the arc length divided by r. That means that d theta dt, which is omega, should be 1 over r times ds dt, which is tangential velocity. The distance that you cover on the arc as you're moving in a circle. And this equation leads directly to this one. Just take one more derivative. The omega dt is alpha, dv dt is tangential acceleration. And there you have it. So this is, how do we call this kind of equation that relates acceleration of one object with acceleration of another object? We had a special name for that. Constraints, constraint equation. This is going to be our constraint equation for this problem. All right? So that is going to be an additional equation that you'll be able to use to solve this problem. We're solving a problem where we have two objects that are moving. One object is the block, which is dropping, right? And the other object is the pulley that is spinning, right? So we better uh, have equations to describe how each of these objects is moving. That's what we do in physics, right? So for the block, let's start with the block. If we want to describe how the block moves, it's a good idea to do a free body diagram for that object. So the block is this point here, which has a weight. And what else is acting on the block? Whatever is touching the block. What is touching the block? Is the pulley touching the block? Pulley is not touching the block. So that is not the force of a pulley acting here. What's touching the block is the string, the rope. And ropes do a particular kind of force, which we call tension. And we usually use T for that. Correct? OK, we're done. That's, that's all that is acting on the block. We're not going to include uh, air drag or anything like that. So the equations of motion for the block are going to be Newton's second law, 
let me pick, remember that when you do a free body diagram, you want to pick your x and your y axis, and I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to say that going down is positive. Because I want to use my constraint equation without any minus sign in it. If the acceleration of the block is positive, the angular acceleration of the pulley, according to my constraint, will be positive or negative. Is that correct? If the block goes down, does the pulley spin this way or does it spin that way? So that is positive, right? So alpha will be positive if the acceleration of the block is positive. So this is the right, uh, not the right, but uh, that will be the way to keep that equation with a positive sign. If you were to choose up going uh, positive, you'll have to include a negative sign in that equation. If you do not include it, then that will be a wrong sign that you will have on, in your final answer. Okay. So if that's the case, then the equation that I need to write is the mass of the, the weight of the block minus the tension should be equal to the mass of the block times the acceleration of the block. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. This is Newton's second law. That's the block. What about the pulley? The pulley is rotating, so I'm not going to use Newton's second law, or uh, I would use Newton's second law for rotational motion. So what do we have for the pulley? The equation that describes the rotational motion of the pulley is the sum of the torques acting on the pulley, which is the net torque, should be equal to zero, different from zero. What should it be equal to? We said here, we said the sum of the forces acting on the block should be equal to the mass of the block times its acceleration. What is the equivalent equation for the pulley? Correct. Moment of inertia of the pulley times the acceleration, angular acceleration of the pulley. What's the sum of the torques acting on the pulley? How many forces are doing uh, torque on the pulley? Let's start with how many forces do you have acting on the pulley? What's touching the pulley is the uh, string on the left hand side, pulling down on the pulley. You have the force of the support, the uh, axis of rotation of the pulley pointing in some direction that we don't know, but that force is going through the axis of rotation, no torque. So the only force that does torque on the pulley is the tension. And the torque that the tension does on the pulley is the magnitude of the force times the moment arm, right? The moment arm is, this is the pulley, you have a force pulling down this way, and this is the axis of rotation. So what is that distance? That is R. So this is tension times the radius of the pulley. That is your torque, and the sign is positive, because this force makes the pulley go that way. And that it, that's it. Sum of the torques equals the moment of inertia of the pulley times alpha. So we have this equation telling us about how the block moves, and we have this equation telling us how the pulley moves. And the motion of each one is connected. This acceleration is connected to this angular acceleration through the constraint equation. So if the question in the problem is find the acceleration of the block, I want to leave A as the variable, and I want to replace alpha in terms of A. And then combine the two equations, and you're done. The thing that you want to get rid of is tension, right? You don't want to leave your answer in terms of the tension. So uh, let's start with this one. Tension equals the moment of inertia of the pulley. Shall we use that it's a disk? If it's a disk, then the moment of inertia has a particular value, right? Which is 1 half of the mass of the pulley times the radius squared. It's something you're going to use. It will be given to you in a problem. It will be in the, in the formula sheet if you need it, and so on. So that's the moment of inertia of the pulley, because it's a disk. and um, I have alpha here, which I'm going to write in terms of A. So alpha is A over R. 
this is alpha and okay let's keep the r here okay so finally from this side from the equation for the pulley we have this r and this r will give you r square which is going to cancel this r square right so this is going to go with that this is going to go with that so you have one half of the mass of the pulley times the acceleration of the block and the final result is at hand now um, God, do I wanna keep it? No. so the mass of the block sorry mass of the block times g minus the mass of the block times a equals tension but tension is that from there so that's equal to one half mass of the pulley times acceleration so the mass of the block times g equals the mass of the block plus one half of the mass of the pulley times the acceleration of the block and your final result then is the acceleration of the block is going to be the driving force which is the weight of the block divided by the inertia of the system So it turns out that the effect of the pulley in the acceleration of the system is to contribute with one half of the mass of the pulley to the inertia of the system.